From the campus studios of Saarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tisha. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ropecast. This is Peter Tisha. And I'm Roger Charlton. Hi, Roger. Hello. You know what gets to me? What's that? I just came back from my English class, right? Yeah. And for the I don't know how many of the time, somebody has asked me, is the English that I speak, meaning American English, really the good English? Or couldn't I tell them something in British, <laughs> which is sort of the standard or the capital S? Yes. I mean, I know you're a Brit, but come on, this is not true. There's a long history of this, though, and I think it all started with the British quite some time ago. As uh -huh. you know, I mean, American English has been around for centuries, although it wasn't always recognized as a, as a, a separate English. Which it is, though. I no, mean, we sound different. It, it's mostly the sounds, isn't it? I mean, mm, True enough, the, but some words, too. The grammar is um, almost identical. Mm -hmm. Whether it's mm -hmm. American or British, it's hard to determine mm -hmm. when you're reading a text. You mm -hmm. just look at grammatical con constructions. Mm -hmm. True enough, but what about that history now? Well, if you... Um, because the, the, the beginnings would probably be with when Noah Webster produced what's regarded as the first dictionary mm -hmm. of American English. That's the one from Merriam-Webster Dictionaries, which you can still buy today. I guess so. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a continuity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Although he's the... not alive anymore. <laughs> I mean, the name is there. But the, the word Americanism goes back even further. That goes back to 1700 and something. Mm -hmm. And someone who was actually born in Scotland and then lived in the States and signed the Declaration of Independence was the first person, apparently, to use the term Americanism. Was he? Who was that? A guy called Witherspoon. Uh-huh. Okay. And he, um, he coined this word, or first used this word, in 1781. Mm -hmm. So that's really the beginning of the, the idea that there's something separate about the way Americans use English. Uh -huh. And then Noah Webster produced his famous dictionary, which didn't come out until 1828. It took him a very long time to produce. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he did not have a computer. That's right, and he was working more or less on his own. So, uh, But tell me something. Do you British look down on Americans for their way of speaking? Well, actually, if you look into comments by British people from about 1828 onwards... There is a whole series of negative comments about American English. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's about individual words, mm -hmm. which are thought to be unnecessary or ugly. Or sometimes it's uh, a totality of the way Americans use English. And the other way around, early visitors to the United States who were well-educated writers like um, Matthew Arnold, Americans found him very hard to understand, and this seems to be because he came from a certain very high level of British society, the kind of Oxbridge English, you know, Oxford, Cambridge. To te yeah, but to tell you the truth, I have a hard time when I watch <laughs> British television, I'm telling you. Right. I mean, when I watch American TV, it's a lot easier for me. But, you know, there is, sometimes I think there is a sort of a backlash. Yeah. Uh, because... For example, speaking of television, when I watch American sitcoms, there will be some of the, let's say it, weirdos in there, <laughs> <laughs> will be the ones who have the British accent right. and who use strange expressions that sort of confuse things, you know, uh, it adds to the comedy as well. But they're also looked down upon. Well, this might be a kind of American revenge for all of the comments over a long period. Uh -huh. I, I, I checked um, the history of the English language not very long ago, and the Americans seem to have been pretty tolerant of British English from soon after World War I, when there was more mixing, whereas British comments have been almost invariably negative. Um, I think also the, the stage standard was British English That's in right. a way, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So on, on, in a play you had to speak British English. Sometimes you can hear that in old movies even. I think developments in the United States have also added to the, the mix because in the early years, the, the East Coast sort of English was kind of American norm, mm -hmm. and that is certainly no longer the case today. Mm -hmm. But I think the, um, 
the, the kind of comments that you can read, which go right back to the late 19th century, indicate that the British are looking down on American users of English. Mm -hmm. And I say that to this day, to some extent, even to this day, although it's a lot less than it was. I think we need to talk about this again, but not for today. Okay, let's leave it there then. Okay. Bye, dear listeners. Bye. Hear you next time. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial.